Yira Sheikh is a doctoral researcher in Urban Informatics Research Group at the Queensland University of Technology Design Lab and Digital Media Research Center. She is an architect and urban design theorist by background. Her research focuses on more than human smart ur urban governance. Before commencing her PhD, she worked as an urban planning consultant at the United Nations Development Program and as a research assistant at Utrecht University. Her artistic practice takes on eco-critical, decolonial, and multi-species approaches to explore human nature relationships. And thank you for staying up so late to present. <laughs> and you thank can- Thank you for the introduction, Flander. Uh, and I'll get uh, into my presentation. Today, I will be discussing the topic, multi-species speculative futures of smart urban ecologies. And my research topic is premised on a thought offered by philosopher Dalia Nasser, who states that the environmental crisis is also a crisis of knowledge and imagination that is disconnected from the environmental reality. And within my research, I explore this disconnection from the environmental reality in the context of cities, but more particularly in the context of smart urban governance. And smart urban governance uh, usually describes how digital technologies and the resulting data uh, is changing the urban governance landscape. So city governments are increasingly using digital technologies to gather data on environment and its multiple species to inform nature conservation policies. However, scholars across disciplines have criticized these technologies for being limited to human perception, exercising spatial control on non-human species and reducing non-human species into numbers that inform policies. To address this issue, my uh, research examines smart urban governance through a more than human lens. And the term more than human refers to the entirety of ecological life, which includes animal, plants, microbes, even humans. And the scholar David Abraham first coined the term more than human to emphasize the human non-human entanglements over the centrality of humans. And therefore taking a more than human approach, I aim to understand social and environmental justice in cities through the lens of more than human. I, I take on the more than human approach as attuning to the wisdom of multiple species through different languages of the natural world that can emerge as sounds, odors, bodily movements, and rhythms of season. In other words, I explore how different non-human life communicates. Scholar Michelle Westerlinken describes such an approach as active listening that is more humbly focused on the other entity as a teller. The idea that animals tell us things recognizes that active participation of other living entities in shaping our lives together. Such telling hardly involves human language. Instead, it is more about acknowledging that animals, plants, and even la different landforms are expressive subjects that can be conversed with. For instance, one example of multi-species wisdom is the underground tree fungal networks. And the tree fungal networks help the trees communicate with each other by sending uh, warning signals, uh, exchanging nutrients. And the uh, author Richard Power describes this relationship in his book, Overstory to, uh, and he say, states, when you link enough trees together, a forest grows aware. And it is talking about how within a forest, the relationship between trees are really strong uh, because of their connections. Whereas within the urban environments, these connections are usually much weaker because of the urban development and construction, which obstructs these uh, communications. And in my study, I look at how we can use different digital technologies to sort of map uh, for example, tree fungal networks to ensure, ensure policies that uh, guide that the networks of trees are connected underground so they have a stronger communities within our cities. And just like trees, we have different urban uh, species and they have their uh, own untold stories that deserve to be whole, told. I explore the stories and voices of koalas, soil ecologies, and the Australian white ibis 
by attuning to them in the Brisbane landscape. And these stories and voices are explored through the speculation of more than human futures with diverse stewards who care for the land and its non-human life forms to create policy interventions that can guide pathways to foster equal rights for koalas, soils, ecosystems, white ibises, and other species. In other words, my research process aims to explore smart urban governance that would embrace the wisdom of multiple species to create policies that help us sense, adapt to the natural world. Thank you. All right, thank you for going first. And it's hard not to add, talk about the mycelial networks because I did a whole project on this myself, but we're going to move on <laughs> and come back. We hopefully. should save that for the conversation. Later. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so next up, uh, we have Sharid Mohammed, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize for the pronunciation of the French in this, but I'm going to try <laughs> in the title. So uh, Sharid Mohammed is currently a PhD candidate in the Literatures and English program at the University of West Indies. St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. His PhD thesis aims to demonstrate that Wilson Harris's shamanistic quantum imagination results in the creation of revisionary and cross-political, across cultural poly, uh, poetics. Uh, his most recent conference paper entitled Le Noir Mont, Sending of the Dead, Wilson Harris's Instrument of Challenge and Disruption to the Territorial Language of Progressive Realism was presented at the University of West Indies, uh, University of Leicester 2021 International Summer School Online Workshop. So um, let me make him a co-host so he can screen share and he will take over the floor. So welcome, Sheree. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon for some people. Um, welcome to the More Just, More Sustainable Futures Conference, the second day of this conference. So I'll now um, begin to share my screen in order to start a synopsis of what I had launched on YouTube. Hi, are you all seeing this, this shared screen? Hi, are you all hearing me? Yes, we can see and we can hear. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks very much. Right, so um, while I was continuing my research up to a few days ago, I was reading Michel Foucault's that the French philosophers um, text entitled The Order of Things. And I came across this interesting quote and I thought that it's really related to, it was in rapport with what um, my presentation is about. So I'm gonna start, it's from, uh, taken from uh, the German alchemist, the German chemist and philosopher, Oswald Krolius uh, from his treatise of signatures. And I'm about to read it. The stars, and he says, the stars are the matrix of all the plants and every star in the sky is only the spiritual prefiguration of a plant such that it represents that plant. And just as each herbal plant is a terrestrial star looking up at the sky, so also each star is a celestial plant in spiritual form, which differs from terrestrial plants in matter alone. The celestial plants and herbs are turned towards the earth and look directly down upon the plants they have procreated, imbuing them with some particular value. Now, I thought that this really was in a rapport with uh, that whole notion of the Treaty of Sensibility that Wilson Harris grapples with. And what exactly is the Treaty of Sensibility? That basically is the a causal or quantum relationship that exists between humanity and the physical landscapes or the non-human dimension. Now, once this, this treaty of sensibility is breached by humanity, 
the living landscapes, they respond with an echoic cry of um, or furious sound um, that's really a lamentation for ecological destruction. Such lamentation is what Wilson Harris terms as the cry of Merlin, which is the cry for dismembered, um, the dismembered landscapes, the destroyed landscapes. And for Harris, the landscapes refers to the riverscapes, the skyscapes, the oceanscapes, the skyscapes, and so on. I'm sure that you have seen it in the um, video that was launched on YouTube. Now, Harris uh, terms this sort of um, this treaty of sensibility as a, a type of ancient vestige of synchronicity. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Right. So he terms this uh, treaty of sensibility as an ancient vestige of synchronicity. And uh, by synchronicity, he means that a causal relationship between the physical and uh, the non physical, between the tangible and the intangible between the human and the non-human. So I'm sure that you're seeing the correspondence with uh, Hira's um, presentation. Now, this sort of uh, synchronistic relationship is actually an a-causal or a quantum relationship that breaches cause and effect, the logic of a cause and effect realism. However, Harris says that this interweaving raises a reality that cannot be glossed by poetic appeals or glossy realist metaphors that exist within the language of progressive realism. And one of the reasons is because the hinge of the expression implies an architecture of the imagination um, fueled by a new conceptual language in which the sense organs of creature and creation elicit a quality of voice and expression unlike one track progressive realism. So Harris is saying that you need to use a different type of language or what he calls that psychophysical medium of language to really give expression to this physical, psychical, quantum, a-causal relationship. And basically the trust of my argument in my presentation really focuses on that disruption of the treaty of sensibility. Once that is disrupted, nature has a way of responding, and that response is a cr the cry of Merlin or that form of lamentation. So basically, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. So, yeah, there's some great connections already going on here, both between plants and, and people. So... Uh, we're going to have the, the third uh, synopsis here. Um, I've already pre-apologized to him for my pronunciations and he's pre-forgiven me. So <laughs> uh, Andre Balau is a PhD candidate in the graduate program in social anthropology at the University um, of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. He researches the scientific, artistic, and cultural histories of Brazilian landscapes at the intersection of science studies, history of science, environmental history, environmental humanities, and visual cultural studies. He is currently coordinating an open access online encyclopedia of anthropology in Brazil. And in the past, he has researched scientific controversies around the climate change and drought in Sao Paulo and wrote his master's thesis on the production of Brazilian climate change science and technology. So welcome, Andre. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Okay. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me and for this amazing, I was there the whole day yesterday, but I didn't ask anything. But um, so um, my name is Andre Bailão and I'm a cis male researcher from Sao Paulo, Brazil, original land of many different Guarani and Tupi peoples, still fighting for the recognition of their rights in this 20 million people metropolis. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. So uh, the Cerrado just, I don't, I don't know if everyone saw the video. The Cerrado is the second largest eco zone in Brazil, comprises grasslands, savannas, woodlands in the Brazilian highlands. For the last three centuries, but mainly in the last few decades, it has become one of the main battlegrounds for the expansion of Brazilian agribusiness, you know, cattle production, soy production and mining. So it's sometimes called the Brazilian Western frontier 
as you know in the United States. So when I started thinking about my own research, the artist Daniel Caballero, you know, from Sao Paulo, started an artistic environmental land art living project with the messy, weedy, low-lying, creeping cerrado plants in the middle of the city that you saw in my presentation. So while that is that isn't exactly the main goal of my PhD, I felt it was something worth following. You know, it was something very special, and it was right in my my own city. So facing climate change, drought, and food scarcity, so several urban art acti activists, sorry, and environmentalists have been working with different projects related to what we, we may call more than urban, more than human landscapes in the city. So there are several projects related to urban agriculture and local grassroots conservation projects, you know, not related to the official ones urban explorations of hidden aspects of landscapes, like hidden rivers. Uh, and they all offer a counter mapping, you know, counter narratives to the common modes of living and imagining the city. So Daniel, the artist, says he wishes to plant the cerrado or mato in the weeds and weedy landscapes in people's imagination. As I say in my presentation, there's a feeling of out of placeness related to a cerrado path inside Sao Paulo. You know, most people who visit the, the path in the first place, you know, in the, they had no idea that there were Cerrado plants, neither in the city's past nor in its marginalized present. So my discussion gains from recent debates on the Anthropocene uh, and neighboring in, in anthropology and neighboring disciplines, like the idea of haunting, ruination, and weedy landscapes, for example, as discussed by Anna Tseng and Andrew Matthews and their colleagues. Uh, so these tiny weeds and grasses of the Cerrado haunt empty urban lots, urban wastelands, sideways, um, all around the city. So taking advantage of the abandonment of these marginal landscapes, marginal, of course, to the market-driven capitalist modes of building and living in a city. So most, if not nearly all attention, public policy, environmental and conservation efforts go towards forests and woods and trees following an imagination of what nature, tropical nature in this case, should be or should look like. The way that many haunted patches of landscapes unsettle some common picturesque broad views, hierarchical tree-centric ways of dealing with landscapes, you know, how they bring our view, our senses, our engagements towards the ground, you know, apart from these picturesque broad views. You know, their shapes, forms, colors, textures, and histories unsettle where and how we should look and we look for the so-called urban ecology, which I hope will resonate with many of you in your own cities, in your own landscapes. And I know that in the UK, there's a, a big discussion now, you know, uh, towards the meadows um, and how they've been uh, almost gone extinct and how many different projects are just trying to you know, look away from the most common depictions of landscapes toward this more marginalized one. So I hope this will resonate with many of you there. So thank you. All right, thank, thank you all. So now just going to open it up to first to the presenters to see if you have converse, questions for each other, any conversations with each other. And if not, we the moderators and, and the other organizers, we have a lot of questions, but we'd like for you to talk to each other first, if you have it. So I have one question, like technically right. to uh, both Andre and Sheree, which is uh, kind of something that I'm grappling with in my own research at the moment. And it comes up in both of your topics as well, where there, uh, there's the sense of false dichotomies in Sheree's uh, work. It comes up between these poetic way of representing or talking about the fractures that we have caused within nature. And then there is more scientific physical way. I think in within your presentation on YouTube, you talked uh, about planetary boundaries, which would be more like a scientific depiction. And in Andre's work, there's also like this uh, dichotomy between bushlands and rainforests and native and non-native and what gets prioritized. I think uh, one of the things that I'm grappling with at the moment is that uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, like within theory or more than human theories, a lot of these dichotomies have been de deconstructed. But when I come to my own research methods and practicing uh, data analysis, uh, 
I feel sometimes restricted as to how do I convert uh, these understandings into practice, uh, which is more conscious and careful uh, than prior academic research methods are. Yeah, I think I'd just like to hear about that if anybody has any thoughts. Uh, yeah, I can start. Thank you, Hida, for, for asking. I have a lot of, of things to comment about your work, too. I think there's a lot of things that are related, uh, even though we're, we're come from very different uh, backgrounds, you know, research backgrounds. Um, yeah, I think this is a big, big question. Like, one of the things that I've, that I've had some trouble uh, with this particular uh, research is the idea of the exotic non-native species because some of those uh there's a there's a big nativist you know imagination towards oh we're only looking towards other kinds of, of species and what about our own you know but some of those those of those species and you know, all those plant species they've been around in brazil since the beginning of the colonial times so 500 years ago and they've managed well you know they've sort of become part of the the landscape and they also offer a lot of of um relation towards animals and 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 other plants so so this is a very complicated aspect you know in the i think in every project that deals with nativists and non-exotic plants you know there are some exotic plants that they aren't necessarily bad for them. So for example, I in that same park where, where the, the Cerrado path is located, there are some euca uh, eucalyptus uh, trees and they're from Australia, they're invasive. They do uh, take a lot of water from the ground, but at the same time, they offer um, a space for several birds because they're so tall. And so there's a big controversy, like, should we cut them down because they, they take a lot of water from this place? This is a place where there's the hidden um, river source, as I showed, you know, there's a little pond that they build. So there was the feeling that, oh, maybe these exotic trees are disrupting, you know, the, the local landscape, but are they only disrupting? You know, I think this is a this de deconstruction of dichotomies and, um, Sometimes they have to be carefully thought about, you know, in the field. I don't know about your. Thank husband. you. Hi, Hira. How are you? Right. So I'm. I hope that I'm um, able to answer um, what you what you're really asking. So I'm going to ask you again. Um, are you looking at um, the issue of science? Um, solving that gap between science and the human imagination, which one should really resolve this, these issues of environmental degradation? Is that a dichotomy that you're looking at? Yeah, in a way like this quantitative and qualitative where like within humanities, like an, a narrative based approach mm -hmm. is encouraged, but of course narrative is also never not mediated by humans. Uh, it's not a natural, uh, way, but at the same within social sciences, there is usually a preference of numbers and quantification and science mm -hmm. reporting. Yeah. Right. So okay. I just felt like if there was a way to take both of them together. Well, I in my research, um, basically, um, it's about linking bridging science with the human imagination, because when you're t when you are um, um, considering the living landscapes or the, the physical landscapes, the non-human dimension, you're really looking at the quantum because the non-human dimension consists of this intricate network of relations, things that you either could tangible and intangible interfuse. Um, the problem here is that how do you give um, representation in first place to something like that um, using the, the, our metrical system, our objective criteria, our scientific method. And uh, if you are able to give um, representation of that, how do you resolve the problem, right? Um, because you're dealing with something that's kind of unattainable. You're dealing with, uh, with basically you're dealing with infinity here. And infinity is a temptation to paranoia. 
right? And it does place um, um, intense pressure on the human sensibility, particularly the scientific sensibility. So I think that is where, you know, and this sort of um, issue um, really should be um, um, articulated by the artistic sensibility. So it's a matter of translating um, the scientific um, type of research into the artistic domain because where science can't really fill that gap to really resolve issues and to imagine the 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 the, the situation on a bigger scale the artistic imagination could actually step in and fill that gap so and once you get the artistic imagination involved um it's it's really rewarding beyond measure because I I would I I think that it's a, it's the only doorway into a, um, a conception of a genuine breakthrough from um, tragic scientific um, representation and um, problem solving. So basically, that's my answer for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think all three of you are kind of breaking dichotomies and showing that it, that things don't work and just as para, you know, opposites, you know, na native and non-native and, and, you know, these all are, they're all, it's much more messy than that. <laughs> the world is much more messy. You can't put it, everything in two camps. Okay, are, are you, are there questions for each other? Right, I have a question I'm for- oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, yeah. I was just gonna say in responding to what you were both saying right now, um, isn't it true that if you begin to replace some sort of key species in the ecosystem, that everything else, many other things will follow. So I have an example of um, a particular area that was devastated by almost 300 years of deep coal mining. And the first thing that came back after that industry stopped was some of the native bulbs and the native daffodils. And within a couple of decades, all of a sudden bird species that they thought were extinct would come out. So I think this is somewhat addressing what you, Sharid, was saying about you know, the quantum aspect. I mean, I don't know that we can design that into it, but perhaps if we put other things in place, um, other things will return and develop. What do you think, Hira and Andre? Yes, I think I would definitely uh, agree that I think we have disrupted our ecosystem without realizing to what extent we have disrupted our ecosystems. Like within cities, there are uh, usually they're lit up during night, but now over the past decades, we have found out uh, how like light night disrupts uh, birds and insects and how different and non-human lives are being uh, lost. And I think we can have a critical reflection of how we disrupt systems and then start reconstructing them back. And I think yeah. Andre's work is directly deals with that. So I'll let him speak, yeah. Yeah, I think this uncontrolled aspect, you know, of the relations, the multiplicity, infinite multiplicity of relations, as Shireed is, is saying, I think this is one of the biggest issues, you know, because both for the direction of extinction and the direction of reconstruction and rebuilding and uh, conservation, we we don't know the all the possibilities, you know, you as you said, you, uh, for example, in the Cejado path, you, you started um, making this, all these plants grow there other than just the the grass, the common grass, you know, that uh, you, you go to a park in Sao Paulo, that's basically the, the you know, the, the what, what you see on the floor, unless you look like really in the, in the tiny uh, sideways and um, sidewalks. And then all this, this kind, all this multiplicity of relations started showing up, you know, all the, the, the fungi and the birds and, and all the insects. And, you know, this is very, very important. And I think this, um, it's all about feral, you know, fer the, fer the idea of ferality, you know, that we cannot control the, um, what happens to the relations once we put in, in ground or what we do to the, 
to the things on the ground. So uh, Hira, you were talking about um, the trees and the, the, the fungal relations on the soil. This is so important, you know, in, in our tropical cities, you know, uh, where we have these big, big storms in the stormy season, on the rainy season, like in, in Southern Asia, in Brazil, you have this idea, old idea, you know, uh, very modernist idea that, oh, we should just plant trees, you know, in a, in a line trees in a, in a street, but then they are completely unconnected to each other and they grow a lot and they are very weak. So one of the biggest issues, you know, environmental issues in Sao Paulo, for example, is that every time the summer arrives with the big storms and every summer the storms are getting uh, bigger, you know, and more dangerous. All those trees start falling, you know, and they kill people, they fall over cars and because uh, the, the connections are not thought about, you know, the soil connections and the, so if you want to talk more about that on your research, I thought that was very okay. interesting, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's this interesting thing, usually even when uh, buildings or parking lots are being constructed, usually how within policies, like they favor uh, like the tree being cut down if its roots are entangled with uh, different buildings or the tree has grown over the years, but they never really took into consideration if uh, the tree that the building should have all uh, been built in a space like if you had a better understanding of how much space the roots require or in case of Brisbane where I come from there's a book by Margaret Cook called uh, a river with a city problem because uh, when the British um, settled over here they constructed uh, the Brisbane city on a floodplain whereas the previous indigenous cultures had this understanding of how the rhythm of the uh, river works and uh, that within different seasons there is a flow uh, and now they have to sort of come up with engineering solutions and they tame the river evil or something that needs to be tamed down through engineering solutions but whereas if you had a better understanding of how the nature works we are less likely to disrupt these systems that we now have to reconstruct Yes, can I add um, to this discussion exactly what you're saying that we need to understand um, um, the multiplicities of this symbiotic relationship. It's about understanding the text of the landscapes and that's um, I had brought across that issue in my presentation or the language of the landscapes, which is very important. And once you understand, remember this, the, this is a language that exists in the quantum dimension. It's, it's a language that's very incomprehensible to everything that we know about um, reality. Our reality is based on causality. So basically what we have done when we, try, when we attempt through our scientific method or through our human methods to assist the environment, what happens is that we place our linear configurations onto the environment. And that's what Andrew was all talking about when we plant trees to help out um, the environment in some way that the trees eventually die and all sort of disruptions, um, even more disruptions take place. Uh, and it's because we just, uh, um, we simply place those linear configurations in, in, in something in a territory of non-configuration, in a territory of infinity, something that's indeterminate, something that you know, we just can't understand. So I think what we need to do is really, um, and that's where the imagination comes in, we just need to embrace this sort of infinity. And once we embrace this, this, this sort of these quantum links and understand that these links do, um, um, uh, do exist, then we could actually um, um, intrude and, um, and, and assist um, the environment in, in, in the way that it needs to be helped. Right? So it's all about understanding the text of the landscapes, the language of the landscapes, which is something that, you know, is very, very difficult because, um, you know, I'm going to last, last night when I was looking at your video again here, I, I saw um, where you placed um, 
um, the human ego next to the ecological um, network. And I found that um, very, very interesting because in order for us to really understand the um, language of the landscapes, or Merlin's cry, um, we really need that shift in the ruling scientific ego to those subjective layers um, within ourselves, to the subjective layers of the imagination. And only then could um, we experience those um, erasure of those habitual boundaries of prejudice, which are really the, our um, scientific concrete limits of um, that really prevent us from extending our senses to perceive this, these quantum links. And once we, once we um, erase those habitual boundaries of prejudice, um, only then could a transformation of community come into place. However, we should, um, it's, um, and once that comes into place, we should not allow it to be something that's fleeting because it could quickly revert back into the ruling ego. And then we get back into the whole, um, we in this repetitive cycle of placing our linear configurations, our fixed causal boundaries on the landscapes. Okay, so basically um, that's what um, I had to really um, assist you guys with, right? I hope it was helpful. Do you have any other questions for each other or should we open it up to the audience? My cat has decided, decided to join the symposium. It had to happen sometime, so just one moment. <laughs> Uh, I have a question for, for Hira. I have act actually a question for, for both of them, but um, I think this question relates to what we're talking right now. Um, I, Hira, I think this is the kind of thinking that you bring is so, so important because when, you know, in our urban life, you know, for us who live in those, you know, big cities and huge metropolis, sometimes it's easy to feel very trapped, you know, like there was no way out of the of the situation we got ourselves in, you know, the concrete jungle. And, um, and I think this kind of um, future thinking towards the, the present, you know, like the back, the, the, the back thinking, this is so important, so necessary, you know, um, how the, the future and the present and the past is always connected, you know, in, the, in our imaginaries. And so I was actually very curious to think um, what kind of, technological data are you considering to you know broaden these ideas of the city you know away from the more technocratic capitalist ones um, um, are you working with future simulations I, I'm curious you know curious about research uh, so I'm not directly engaging with any kind of data I think I'm just different working with uh, when I conduct my workshops so they usually have like different people who are like environmental lawyers bioethics okay. engineers or people who work within the government or different environmental NGOs. And I just take their perspective. And I think the uh, understanding is like how now within bioacoustic uh, fields, uh, people like they have started to understand what, uh, for example, bird songs mean, but not necessary to use technology, but if you have a tool rather than quantifying, uh, like bird species into occurrence records within biodiversity databases, maybe it could be more useful to use technologies to understand bird languages because there is enough scientific research proving that the birds communicate in a very similar way as humans do. They have grammar and syntax and mm -hmm. their calls have different meanings which could range from like calling to a mate or protecting their territory and these are like very basic things that human understand. Perhaps they're having uh, much deeper complex conversations that we are not aware of uh, yet, or we don't have the capacity to understand. Like Sharid said, it's like an infinity world out there. Uh, but maybe just trying to tap into that. I know that we'll always be in some way limited to the human framing. We can't entirely escape that but escaping the centrality of always putting our thoughts in the way we see the world first. Like, I think that results in like Sharid also said, like a very control or management, management based or like linear approach to packaging nature uh, in order to conserve it or protect it. 
Whereas uh, what we probably need to do is uh, nature is already capable uh, of preserving itself. It has a work to do so for uh, millions of years. And uh, I think if we paid more attention to how nature works and sort of facilitate it rather than try to control it. Uh, yeah. So like, how technologies can sort of be moved towards that shift. And I think just like policies on trees being connected within the city, there could be policies that help because different native birds or local species of birds within cities are now not able to communicate with each other because of the traffic noise often. So there can be policies that recommend that the uh, popular, uh, like the uh, noise pollution within the cities stay within a certain limit, or at least there is then tree buffering or so of some sort to ensure that the local bird species can communicate and yeah, how technologies can perhaps help us come to uh, such policies, yeah. Right, I just need to, um, to um, continue with what you, um, Hero was saying there. And um, you were saying that, you know, um, you were reiterating um, the whole notion of the infinite and, you know, we have to be careful of how we manage the, um, um, ecological destruction and how we try to um, implement things to help the environment and without uh, um, instituting our fixed um, scientific methods because it just is not work it just doesn't work so you know my thing about it is that you know when you're dealing with the infinite you're dealing with quantum links you're also dealing with space and uh, I mean space is um, we just can't flatten space because um, it's just very infinite. And if the landscapes are infinite, therefore you need open spaces. That's my take on this. Um, the minute we, we, um, we fix the landscapes in nice pre-packaged geometrical designs, that's where the issue comes in. It's all about um, um, interacting with this sort of dimensionality. And I think that, you know, humanity has not really embraced space, which is kind of ironic because um, space in Einsteinian mathematics is actually curved. Space consists of many rooms and dimensions. So we have, we know the science, the science is there, but it's just that we're not using the type of science to really comprehend the landscapes. And that's the problem. It's just that we're using we, we, we tend to choose um, the type of science that really causes further destruction. So, I mean, this, this knowledge is, is it's out there, um, but it's, it's, it's very ironic that we're not implementing it, you know? Right, so that's my, my take on this, and that's issue. Hey, thank you. Uh, it looks like we do have a question from the audience. If we do, Karina, do you want to? Hi, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, congratulations for uh, these, three these three amazing uh, proposals. Uh, I really enjoyed and I was really excited to hear uh, each one of you to talk about uh, your researchers, researches. And what I, what I have, it's, it's, I think it's not exactly, um, uh, question, but more a comment. Uh, well, I come from the ecomusicology field, and what we are trying to do in eco in ecomusicology right now is to go over the the, the separation uh, between nature, culture, and hard sciences, and human sciences, and ecological sciences, and it, it really caught my attention for what you were saying uh, that, um, about this crisis, this environmental crisis is a result of the, um, a, a, a crisis in, in the production of knowledge. And I'm, I, I, I totally agree with that because um, now in, eco, in ecomusicology, uh, we are trying to uh, build bridges uh, between these different areas uh, bringing an interdisciplinary perspective for discussions of researches, and uh, it, it really it, it's really interesting to me uh, the the, uh, the way you you all are are bringing this this 
issue of um, the 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 the, uh, the way um, we could how can I say sorry um, a way to to go over this dichotomies and it's also an issue for for ecomusicology and we are trying to to build these bridges to to recover the bonds uh, between um, all these these areas and I think. This is something essential to, to rethink a future and to re rethink our relationship uh, with nature, with the landscape, with the environment, uh, thinking, of, thinking of the perspective of sound, sound produ production. And I think my question would be, uh, have you ever uh, thought about including the sound perspective in your in your projects uh, to um, have this analysis, this more holistic vision of uh, the environment, including the sound the sound dimension. Yes, um, can I go first? Right. So I'm glad that you brought up um, the whole issue of ethnomusicology because actually in my PhD thesis, I'm actually looking at um, something called the sonic texts of the living landscapes or signals which are planted in the landscapes, which are really inaudible to, um, um, to our causal reality. So basically, um, I, I'm not sure if you're very familiar because I'm focusing, I'm actually using the theory of uh, um, ethnomusicologists like Brabeck de Maury. I'm sure you're very familiar with him. And mm -hmm. uh, Matthias Louis, um, he is an ethno musicologist slash anthropologist. Um, I actually had to go back into the work of the German anthropologist, um, Theodor Koch Grunberg, who actually did seminal work way back in the 19th century, I think, mm -hmm. 18 or 19th century. I'm, I can't really remember the figure. But um, he actually did the first um, research about the um, Amazonian tribes and their belief in that so-called sonic communication that's really in the living, that, um, that, that exists in the uh, multiplicities of symbiosis in the non-human dimension in living landscapes. And um, in my research, I actually show that um, Wilson Harris, that's right, I'm studying, he actually um, infuses the, um, the Makusi tribes belief in the sonic text, their tribe in the Amazon um, of the living landscapes as that form of psychophysical medium of communication. And he says that we have lo really lost Western civilization. They have really lost that sort of ability to communicate with, this, with the sonic. And because they have lost the ability, they can no longer communicate with the quantum, with the infinite. And um, so it's it's it and basically it's you know it's it's all about um, understanding um, the language of the landscapes. And you know we have cultures that really understand this, and that is why they they have this deep respect for the environment. Um, so. I'll just give you an example. Um, the Makusi tribe in the in the in in the Amazon rainforest, they actually um, hold the belief in something called the music of the fish. So they actually understand when it's time to actually um, go fishing when when these fishes are actually breeding. So you know they they have this sort of balance because of that. Um, um, I built this um, language of translation, which is a sonic, which bridges humanity with the um, with the lands, with the non-human. Um, they actually understand how to maintain that sort of balance, and all you know. So it's all. Um, goes back to what here I was talking about that particular river and um, that the engineers realized that something was really, they didn't understand the tidal flow and the tidal rhythm, right? And it's, and it's all, it's, it's, it's because you just don't understand the language of, of the infinite, of the landscapes. And once we don't understand that sort of thing, um, which, is, which is something that's musical, um, we, we find ourselves in a, in a lot of distress because we simply keep imposing what we assume to be the right method. And uh, um, again, you know, that, that, that method is actually based on the whole notion that we, and we, we flatten and block the dimensionality of the landscapes. And, and, and it's a, just a continuous process. So I think we just need to reconfigure, uh, you know, those methods and, and especially the, the the, the, the scientists who are involved, um, once they start to reconfigure and really understand what's taking place, like um, the 
this particular scientist, his name is Johan Rockström, um, who speaks about planetary boundaries. He's actually one of the scientists who actually incorporates this whole notion of, uh, um, uh, you know, understanding that um, particular dimension that the landscapes belong to. And, you know, so once we get those kind of technocrats involved and they push forward this kind of um, um, issue, and we probably there could be um, um, all these problems could be resolved. Great. Thank you, Sharid. <clears throat> Thank you. Andre Hira, do you have any follow up on this? Uh, I think like for me, I haven't necessarily figured it out, uh, figured out like how to include uh, sound in my work, but uh, I think the emphasis on listening uh, is, uh, yeah, I think I place a lot of emphasis in listening and I think I engage with David Abraham's work, who's in his books, uh, Spell of the Sensi, as much like what Sharid was talking about, says that how the humans, uh, since they sort of transformed to focus on written language. Uh, they have lost that um, connection with nature, which a lot of uh, indigenous uh, cultures sort of communicated through oral storytelling. And I think if we look back into their uh, cultures, there is this understanding uh, that uh, nature is always a, a always has agency and always communicates and that comes through within their oral storytelling whereas uh, within the written word or more scientific disciplines because they sort of uh, inhabited uh, their legacy from uh, western philosophical thinking which up until very recently sort of uh, use terminologies of muting or silencing or erasing the non-human. And just within the past decades, there has been this acknowledgement. And I think those cultures um, who engaged uh, like uh, in oral storytelling uh, ha had that agency or understanding of nature preserved. And that's something I'm definitely interested in exploring. Thank you. Right. I'm very, very pleased that you brought up David Abram here because, um, you know, um, he does um, say that, you know, we have linguistically denied the, um, the landscapes, um, which is which is so important because if we simply and, and that's why I was saying before that we need to really embrace um, the this uh, um, incomprehensive type of reality. And, um, and if we do it, uh, then we could actually bring it across into our language as what Wilson Harris does, where he tries to create this sort of psychophysical um, language, which would give reality to um, the multiplicities of symbiosis, right? And, you know, I just want to add that, you know, um, we tend to think that um, Western philosophy and Western theory have really denied the, um, the landscapes of voice, but there's a particular French philosopher um, in the early 19th century, his name is Mer um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, in his books such as The Visible and the Invisible, The, um, the Prose of the World, and Phenomen Phen he's a phenomenologist, so he has a text entitled, a really seminal a good seminal text entitled The Phenomenology of Perception, where he actually speaks about um, those um, um, echoes that exist in the environment that we simply are disconnected with. And uh, um, he goes on further to say that's way before all these um, environmental issues popped up, you know, so you had somebody who was actually thinking out of the box in the European philosophical tradition. And he was actually saying that, you know, because our bodies are made up of the same substance, therefore we have um, this direct relationship with the, with the physical environment because the physical environment has the same chemicals that our bodies have. And so therefore we don't, when we, when we say that we look at the environment, we actually look together with the environment. We are just part of this intricate network. So, you know, um, we had people who were actually grappling with these issues, but I think, you know, they, their, their philosophy, because, you know, everything is just based so much on, 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 a, on a rigid symmetrical type of thinking and a causal type of thinking that their, their, their philosophy was actually kind of blocked and flattened, you know, um, as the years progressed. So 
you know, but um, I'm glad that, you know, people are still doing research and bringing up these, uh, that these, this rich eclipse knowledge, um, you know, that we could actually turn to, to resolve Thank these you. issues. Thank you. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we're, this is some rich conversation here. We're running, we are over on time, but we can go a couple more minutes because we started a couple minutes late. <clears throat> we have several questions in the chat. So maybe panelists, if you have the energy, you can try to answer them in the chat because we are definitely going to run out of time. One that I, I, I thought could apply to everyone. And so I would start there um, is what are your views on rewilding landscapes? So uh, Andre, I haven't heard from you in a little while. What do you, you think about this? Yeah, it's 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 a big thing right now. I think uh, in many places, it's it's a complex theme, you know, because of exactly the the ferality of of the of of all those these relations that we don't know exactly how will they play out, you know, on the ground. So the so the the rewilding uh, there's a lot of rewilding projects that uh, have to deal with you know the neighboring landscapes and neighboring humans and uh um i think scale here is is such an important aspect you know the uh that i think that i think that anna Singh sort of discusses in in her book on, on mushrooms you know uh, the importance of thinking about the different scales in in both in time and in space you know like from the tiny relations on the ground to the bigger aspects of, of capitalist forests and um, and also the, how these deep histories keep haunting us back, you know, keep popping up. So sometimes those rewilding re projects are criticized because they sort of create a almost artificial natural uh, landscape. So I don't know how other people think about that, you know, like um, let's throw a lot of animals, you know, from the, from before the Neolithic revolution into this tiny space and let's see how this so I don't know I've, I've heard about a lot of projects that are being criticized about you know creating a, a different kind of uh, natural non-artificial imagination which is artificial but um I don't know what others think yeah, and this is before we're even getting to the company who is about to reintroduce the woolly mammoth. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, Hira, you've uh, you're dealing with urban like landscapes. Uh, Have you deal with rewilding? What are what are your feelings on this? Uh, I think uh, I think like Andre said, I think you have to be conscious about what you're doing, and then again, I think what we are talking about like throughout the presentation is not uh, exerting our control in rewilding, but rather than understanding nature and its need and being more conscious in what we implement. I have definitely heard of good examples of rewilding where they introduced a certain species and then all of a sudden there was a revived ecosystem, a lot of species that had been lost in an area started mm -hmm. to come back and how that community uh, came back together. Uh, but I think like just re uh, unconscious rewilding of planting trees sometimes is an easy scapegoat or like uh, then term, like, yeah, is more like a greenwashing effort instead of really tackling the real issues. So yeah, I think scale matters in terms of, because we can maybe, that's how we become more conscious uh, of what we are implementing. And yeah, I suppose just staying away from uh, just mindlessly planting trees, but, and sometimes there are like non-native trees that can eventually cause further damage if there's not a lot of understanding to the process. Yeah, I think for example, fire is such an important aspect of some of those rewilding projects because uh, in the last few decades there have been a, a big effort into considering fire as a artificial element, you know, when in fact, in the deep history of many landscapes, you know, human fire and natural fire have been part of the, of the, and now all this kind of feral, unpredicted um, consequences are, are started to pop up, you know, those huge fires that are taking place in California and Mediterranean and Brazil, because 
actually the fire was kept out, you know, in, in, uh, in order to somehow artificially protect uh, what some people consider to be uh, more natural uh, species, you know, and then they drove out um, people out of some places and those people have been actually managing, you know, the landscape for centuries, for millennia, and then all sorts of uh, unpredicted consequences come from that. Um, so these big projects are always... <laughs> yeah. Right. So could I yeah. just add? Could I just add my little two cents? Right. Yeah. Very so, quickly. So, so this whole you. this whole issue of rewilding, I think we need to take into consideration that um, humans are part of the multiplicities yeah. of symbiosis. So I think that we need to rewild ourselves also, <laughs> and um, and not only that, but we need to rewild our sense of causal space because what we really need to become involved is that whole notion of space. We have placed a linear space on the environment and you know we think in this type of linear space and so when we consider rewilding we have to think about breaching that really uniform type of space that we tread upon earth which also has this extrapolation space um a simple thing as you know when we fly in an aeroplane um we um we think that the sky um, is a flattened field which has dispensed with you know the quantum horizontality and verticality, um, except well in moments of precipitous descent. Well, you know, but you know, once we breach that uniform type of thinking, that uniform spatial thinking, um, we would really arouse, you know, that ability to see the interwoven reality of man-made and really primordial worlds. And once we, so you know, it all begins with rewilding our sense of. Co um, our causal cause and cause and effect reality, our causal consciousness. So I think that's the first thing we need to rewild. <laughs>